Excelsior, true believers! You are about to embark upon a journey, a trip to the 70s and 80s, when mighty Marvel Comics ruled over all. The Defenders, Doctor Strange, the Champions, Deathlock, the Submariner, the Incredible Hulk, Kill Raven, the Son of Satan, the Macabre Man Thing, and all your other Bronze Age favorites every week appearing on Defenders Dialogue. Now, here are your guides, Christopher Golden and Brian Keane. Excelsior, true believers. Excelsior, indeed. Welcome back once again to Defenders Dialogue. Brian Keane. I'm Christopher Golden. And Brian, how are you today, my friend? I'm good, man. I, uh, you know, I, as, as I've said countless times on the show, I look forward to doing this with you every week. Um, it's, it's my one true form of escape. It used to be, I had this and I had my cat and I had my youngest son. Uh, and that, those were my forms of escapism, but you know, my cat died during the pandemic and, and, my youngest son has turned into a teenager during the pandemic, and Dad's just not cool anymore, and we can't play action <laughs> figures. So, was that on so his all birthday? I have left was it like was what? it on his birthday that he was like, you know what, Dad, you're not cool anymore. You know, it almost was. Um, and don't get me wrong; he's still a great kid, and we are super blessed. Uh, but you know, it gone are the. The days of getting down and playing action figures and even video games now. He, he, he'd rather play them with his buddies. And I get that. It's a pandemic. He doesn't see his friends. If right. he has an opportunity to play video games with them, I, I'm not going to get in the way of that. Uh, Pretty soon but, he's just going to cast you aside entirely for girls. But that started already, too. Um, I do still get cool points, though. You know, he's very big into... as as kids his age are he's he's very big into youtube and these youtube personalities and his his very favorite youtube personality of the month uh apparently was talking about clickers the other day in a video and he got so excited because of course his dad you know uh co-invented the clickers with jf gonzalez and, and mark williams and uh so i got some cool points for that but well, I think that uh, two things. Number one, I, I feel comfortable saying that I'm sure that Mary San Giovanni would be more than happy to play action figures with you. Yeah, she, she's not, though. She's not. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not the same with playing action figures with her. <laughs> well, look, whatever, whatever anybody tells you, and even though you currently look like the Unabomber, don't borrow anybody else's kid to play action figures with. That's frowned. No. Upon. You frowned know, upon. I was going to plug your new book, Red Hands, uh, which is out in bookstores right now, today, actually, as this is airing. But then you had to go and call me the Unabomber. And, uh, <laughs> well, I tapped have out you... the Saul Berenson references last week. <laughs> Even though I really did, and I was disappointed, by the way, because I did tweet at you last week and you put up a picture of yourself looking very much like Mandy Patinkin as Saul Berenson in Homeland. Um, and Mandy Patinkin did not reply. And it made me really sad. He doesn't run his own Twitter account. But we did find out, thanks to that Twitter thread, uh, that that my dear friend, author Christopher Triana once sold pills to Mandy Patinkin. <laughs> oh, my. Okay. Yeah, he, he didn't specify what kind of pills. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to know what kind of pills. Uh, but I was going so with this. But, oh, I remember the Unabomber. Um, <laughs> I told this story on the horror show with Brian Keene. But, of course, we don't have that show anymore. All all I have now is is you, Chris. Uh, but I have to <laughs> share this need, story. Brian. All you need. Because, well, our audience for Defenders Dialogue is very different than the horror show audience was. So I, I want to share this story. So back when they released that FBI sketch of the Unabomber, do you remember that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. My father decided at that time that it looked like me. 
and actually told the FBI, I think my son might be the Unipower. Oh, come on. <laughs> right hand to God. <laughs> oh, my so, God. So, of course, you know, uh, I, I guess they looked into me and they, they came and interviewed me. It was uh, it was that was the first time I was ever interviewed by the FBI. But um, it gets less nerve wracking the, the more you've had that happen. But. Yeah, they, they, they determined, determined that, didn't have the capacity to build a bomb. Is that well? No, they determined that I wasn't the Unabomber. Uh, but <laughs> Mary had never heard this story, and uh, the reason we brought it up on the horror show with Brian Keen is, is is when Mary and I first started dating, we were over to visit my parents, and my sister made the offhand comment, "Yeah, Dad, remember when you thought Brian was the Unabomber?" And, you know, my family just chuckles about it. And Mary was shocked. I mean, she was aghast. She's like, what the hell? See, now the weird thing is not that your family uh, had that conversation or that your father did that, but that Mary was surprised by it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's a different world down here in rural Pennsylvania than she used to. <laughs> It's a world where growing up in the 70s and 80s, the only entertainment value you had were those Bronze Age Marvel comics, which is what we're here to talk about today. Uh, Man-Thing issues 11 and 12. Yeah, so um, issues 11 and 12. Issue 11, uh, written by Steve Gerber, art by Mike Plug, with inks by Frank Ciaramonte. You know, the interesting thing about these two issues, Brian, is they feel like they're among Gerber's most self-indulgent. Yes. And Gerber Gerber is one of the most self-indulgent writers to have ever worked for Marvel um, because he was allowed to kind of do whatever he wanted. But 95% of the time, that's a really good thing, that he's sort of allowed to do whatever he wants. Um, and uh, And these couple of issues are just really... They're good and they're interesting, but they're sort of quiet and almost lethargic in some ways. Uh, and anyway, so let's talk about issue 11, Dance to the Murder. They yeah, both I, have sort of themes as well. They do. And I, I got to tell you, this this issue, issue 11, and I say this as possibly the world's biggest Steve Gerber devotee, yeah. uh, this this. To me, this is probably my least favorite thing he ever did. Uh, it, it's it's instantly forgettable, in my opinion. Um, it's it's a ridiculous storyline, and uh, I don't know. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. Uh, I, do, <laughs> I, I I do like the opening though, uh, where you know we we see our our old friend supporting character Richard Rory sitting out in the swamp cooking his dinner again. Um, you know, he's been dumped once again. Uh, and I feel like Gerber Richard Rory opens. has a, he, he has a job. He's a disc jockey. And so like, to me, it's like, why are you out? He, you, one would assume he's camping, but he's not camping because he has no tent. He's just sitting out in the fucking swamp. Well, he's making, got, he's got his minivan. Coffee over a fire. He but he's lives no, no backpack. Minivan. There's no tent. Anyway, continue. No, he lives. He lives. He lives in his minivan. Okay, remember? Yeah, but, but obviously, obviously, you never worked in radio. I, I have worked in radio, and and this is not far fetched. Oh, I do now. Now that you point that out, I do. On the first page, you could see the minivan off to the right. Yeah. I didn't realize it was there. So, in the because in the in the subsequent pages, there's no sign of his minivan. No, and there's was, not. So he's just randomly in the swamp making coffee. <laughs> He's gonna light like, on fire in a minute. Uh, uh, well, I, like I said, you, you, you've never worked in radio. If, if you've worked in radio, particularly the overnight shift, which is what Rory has, this is not far fetched. You, you would have to live out in the swamp, <laughs> in a van down by the river. In a van down by the river. <laughs> uh, but no, I I like what Gerber does here in the opening page. He says horror can assume many forms. The bloodlust of the vampire, the savagery of the werewolf, but perhaps the deepest variety of all is also the quietest, the horror of unchosen solitude, the gnawing pain within one man, the ordeal of loneliness. 
So we're we're getting into some Charles Grant T M Wright quiet horror with this issue, right? And next issue even more so. Yes. Next issue is is really self indulgent, but let's we'll 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 go on with with this. So so yeah, it is the the Charles Grant T M Wright quiet horror. It's uh it's nice and sort of ponderous. I I like that. Um, and then he's just sort of hanging out. He he sees the man thing looming as usual and they have a little chat one-sided uh chat and then there's the sound of a gunshot uh richard rory sees a uh a young woman uh in an outfit that i'm confused by but uh, it seems to be some kind of uh um fishnet but now then then colored blue I don't know. It's very strange, but she has what appears to be some kind of ceremonial dagger. Uh, he rushes after her to try to give her aid because he assumes she's running from whoever just fired that shot. Uh, he ends up tripping over her, going face first into the swamp. Um, she thinks that he was attacking her because right. she thinks that he's one of the guys who has been chasing her and, uh, and she thinks he has just taken off his mask and uniform, and so she attacks him. That's right. She more, she brandishes the dagger. She says, I'll kill you. You won't take me hostage again. But before she can do that, the man thing isn't about to let somebody hurt one of his few human friends. He reaches out. He grabs her wrist. She knows fear. And, of course, she begins to burn at his touch. Uh, but we see that the bond between Rory and the man thing is deepening. Uh, he tells the man thing, stop, let her go. And the man thing does. The man thing does, which allows a Richard to play a uh, white knight to the damsel in distress. Um, I say that sort of derisively, but again, we, you know, it's a, uh, we've all written that story in any case. Uh, all she knows, her name is Sybil Mills. And all she knows is that this group of strangely masked men, uh, tried to kidnap her. She doesn't know why, or or she doesn't get to say why, before one of those very same armed, uniformed, masked men uh, shows up and trains his weapon on Richard Rory and Sybil. Now, Brian, this mask is really weird looking. It it's, looks- uh, it, it's like, a, like, like a, a facial deformity of some sort, but it's a metal mask. Yeah, it almost looks like a mandrill, uh, but it is nothing to do with the mandrill from. Uh, but it, but it, it looks like a deformed human face under the mask or inhuman face. Sybil goes to run. Uh, she is shot in the back, Brian, and the the shooter comes rushing after them, uh, only to be met with our good friend, the man thing. That's right. Now the shooter is telling Rory, "Hey, I, I, I aimed. I didn't aim to kill her. Uh, you know, I aimed just to wound her. Uh, you know, indicating that he's some kind of sharpshooter, maybe military trained. Uh, but before we can get anything else, you know, the man confronts him. The two of them fight, um, and you know, the the man thing makes easy work of him. Uh, and Rory and Sybil." escape back to his minivan. Um, and then we get her backstory. Uh, well, we find out that, that, that the, the minivan's tires have been slashed. Oh, yes, that's important, yes. But yes, go ahead to the to the backstory. Yeah, so, uh, you know, she was waiting for her brother to pick her up after dance class in Miami. Which explains when all of a sudden, yeah, these these guys in these metal masks, these weird, you know, uh, pseudo military costumes kidnap her, shove her into a car. She says that each of them, the the face on each mask was different, but all equally grotesque. Uh, and they tell her that she is now a prisoner of the demons of liberation, and she'll be set free when their demands are met. <laughs> but then she, you know, she uh, they stop in the Everglades. And uh, she manages to elude them, escapes into the swamp, and that's where uh, Rory found her. Yeah, that's where Rory found her, and uh, you know, he uh, he treats the burn that Man Thing left on her arm with the first aid kit that he had in the van, uh, and then they have to try to uh, to safety. The Man Thing is not chasing them; 
because his focus is on another masked man, another member of the Demons of Liberation uh, who is chasing her as well. Uh, that guy tries to attack the man thing. That doesn't go well for him. Now, I did like this part. We've seen over and over again, you know, uh, in fact, I think Gerber has come to rely on it a little too much. People shoot bullets at the man thing. The bullets have no effect. This guy tries a grenade (laughs) (laughs) and he tosses it into the man thing. It gets sucked into the man thing's body and then it explodes outward. Uh, you know, leaving the man thing studded with shrapnel uh, and the the would be attacker dead. A piece of shrapnel exploded out of the man thing right into his chest. Uh, Rory takes the opportunity to remove the metal mask and he is horrified by what he sees beneath. But we, the reader, don't see it. Right. Uh, he takes Sybil, R- Richard Rory takes Sybil to the motel that's about a mile down the road. This is a motel we've visited before, Brian. That's um, right. It is, uh, it is the uh, it is run by a guy who's fast becoming one of my favorite supporting characters in this book. I don't know it, <laughs> but you know, one time here's a tangent. Uh, many years ago, when I was 21 years old, uh, Connie, who is now my wife. Uh, was my girlfriend then. Connie and I and her sister, Julie, and Julie's then boyfriend, now husband, Michael, uh, were fortunate enough to take a trip to Europe where we stayed in a variety of places and, you know, uh, went around for like three weeks. And one of our first stops was in Ireland. And we were in a bed and breakfast right outside Ireland. And Julie and Connie had to turn their whatever rings they had, they put on their wedding finger and turned the rings around to look like plain gold bands because we had to pretend that we were married in order to be able to share a room. Wow. Uh, because the, the uh, elderly Irish woman who ran this bed and breakfast, this sort of rooming house, uh, would not rent to us if we were um, living in sin. That's so wild. that reminds me of that's a you know I mean that reminds me of uh, of this guy. Uh, they come in, and he says, "Well, well, it ain't Joe College again, and with another lady friend yet. Still won't rent you a single room, kiddo. So why don't you?" But of course, all Richard Roy says is, "Quick, where's your phone?" But I just love this guy. I love the like you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's not gonna he's not gonna contribute to your sin, Brian. No, he's not. Uh, well, the the demon liberation burst into the hotel lobby, and before they can do anything, the man thing through the lobby window to save his friend. They shoot a rocket launcher at him this time, or I think it's a rocket launcher. <laughs> it, it it looks like some seventies Marvel rocket launcher. Uh, yeah, whatever the thing. Have, I love their weapons. I mean, they literally look like. Where did these things come from? But go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, you know, it, it knocks Man Thing back out into the parking lot, and then they open fire. Of course, uh, we know that the bullets have no effect on the Man Thing, but we're told that one of their weapons fires something other than bullets—a strange shaft of light that slices away at him like a steel blade, probably a laser. Yeah, uh, also it's a laser. <laughs> <laughs> And, and uh, let's just say for the say, let's just for the record say, surely at the time Gerber wrote that description, he knew what a laser was. But well, was, I think he's, he's doing it from the man thing's perspective. Would the oh, man, man thing know what a laser? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so the man thing manages to to triumph over the laser guy as well, and and the. Uh, the demons of liberation give up. They say, call off your pet. We know when we're beaten. Uh, and Rory makes them take off their masks. And what is revealed, Chris? <laughs> what is revealed is that their faces are the same as their masks. They are, they are, are, are misshapen flesh uh, beneath their, their masks. Uh, the masks are made to reflect... Uh, basically their inner ugliness, their disfigurement, uh, except for the leader. 
but his face is the greatest shock of all because it's the face of her brother, a battle-scarred Vietnam veteran. Uh, he says, we never meant to hurt you, Sib. We were hoping that once you knew why we did this, you'd join in the hoax. Ed, Vic, Toby, and I were all caught in a napalm burn back at Nam. You know the whole story. And, and you know, too, that because of my face, I haven't had a job since I came back home. None of us have. We wanted to hit back at the hypocrisy of it all. Uh, basically, they just wanted the public to know that they were going through this horror in some dramatic way. And Richard Rory says, so he kidnapped his own sister? Sure. <laughs> and it's just, <laughs> Richard Rory thinks that this is as stupid a plan as I do. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, it, none of it makes any sense. No. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, it's, hey, look. It's prop- thing, Gerber, Gerber, I think, and again, who knows? But if I had to guess... I would say that Gerber had the idea for the guys who were disfigured on the masks. Uh, the big reveal is that the masks are the same as the faces underneath. And he was like, oh, hmm, how do I work that in? And he came up with this ludicrous, like, last four panels, which is literally like a Scooby-Doo explanation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, props to Gerber for spotlighting, you know, and an important part of the Vietnam War wasn't just guys coming home with PTSD. There were guys coming home with deformities as well, uh, induced by our own weapon. It had the story been executed with a little bit more panache, shall we say. Exactly. I suspect at at this time in Marvel history, Gerber was writing this monthly. Uh, He was doing the Giant Size Man Thing books. He was doing uh, Marvel 2-in-1 and a uh, couple other books as well. Uh, I, I suspect what happened here is he had a day before the deadline and he just banged it out real quick. Yep. <laughs> and, and that's what we got. Yeah. Issue 12 is called Song Cry of the Living Dead Man, written by Gerber, uh, layouts by John Buscema, and finished art by Klaus Janssen. Uh, go for it, Brian. Um, yeah, we open the a splash page where the the man thing is standing outside of an abandoned asylum. Great setting for a horror story. Uh, An abandoned asylum in the middle of the swamp. Um, And somebody is speaking inside. Uh, He says, I want to kill you. I want you to die, but it can wait until we're done with the flowers. Why don't you love me? I was only doing my job. I didn't deserve to be picked apart. Oh, Apparently, it's a madman inside the, the abandoned asylum. Yeah, I, I actually, um, I love the setup for this issue. I don't, I don't love the execution, but I love the setup of it, which is that um, this guy is is trying to finish some written work. We're not privy to what that written work is, but he's trying to get the words down. But he keeps getting. Uh, Uh, interrupted the hurt he calls it gets closer and gets bigger the hurt is like pursuing him and menacing him as he tries to finish whatever this work is um and it's sort of like trying to meet a deadline in 2020 brian yeah Um, exactly (laughs) this guy his name is brian lazarus uh and when the man thing peers through the the barred windows of the old asylum he sees him sitting uh at a, an old table writing by the glow of a single candle. Uh, and we're told that he's been living here for days on beans and canned meat. Sleep doesn't leave this tiny room. And, and we see him, you know, writing by hand in this, this giant journal. Yeah. And he's, uh, he's interrupted um, by a knock at the door. Uh, who's a guy says, it's only me, Brian just thought you should know it's time again. Uh, Brian says, oh, they can't wait. I'm so tired, but let's get it over with. And uh, basically, the man thing is about to leave when he feels the the rage of emotions that that comes screaming from inside the asylum. He looks back in the window and Brian Lazarus is being attacked by multiple people who weren't there just a moment before. Yeah. And. To cut to the chase, Brian Keene, 
uh, they are they are physical manifestations of his anxieties. It's uh, it's the people, it's the bill collectors, it's the grocer you know, who wants his his payment. Um, it, it's the police who wanted to pay for a parking ticket. It's the landlord who wants him to pay the rent. Uh, and they're being it's physical manifestations of this anxiety of someone who can't afford to pay his bills. Exactly. I remember reading this as a kid and I did not understand it. I, I had no idea what was going on. I thought they were real people. It made no sense to me. It was still cool. But but rereading this as an adult, this is pretty goddamn brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, you know, so the man thing, uh, you know, is responding to the terror in the room, the fear in the room. And he rips the uh, the bars off the window. He smashes the window. He grabs one of the people, yanks him out. And as soon as he's away from Brian Lazarus, this uh, this bill collector, whoever he is, essentially turns to smoke and, and go, you know, is, is washed away on the wind. Uh, the man thing reaches in and grabs Brian Lazarus and yanks him out of the room. He does stay solid, but inside the room, all of those physical manifestations, uh, you know, turn to mist and, and blow away. That's right. Uh, Lazarus feels fear, of course, uh, begins to burn at the man thing's touch. But that instance of physical pain produces a surprising result. Uh, his terror abates. Uh, you know, he's 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 not clear headed, but he's not afraid anymore. Um, it, it says that uh, his 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 confusion remains, but he's lucid. Um, and, you know, you get sort of like this guy's kind of waking up from a dream. Um, he is he sort of, coming to the asylum. Yeah. Back he's like, how did I get here? I was in the office. Right. Typing up the song cry, he calls it. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I appreciate your giggling at that. Um, I felt the same way. The song cry of the living dead man. He finished it and realized it wasn't enough. So he came out here to get the words down. It's too late to stop the hurt. I had to explain how I let the hurt get me to somebody who'd listen without asking for something. If I just got the words down, they'd find their way to someone. Um, so he's sort of trying to figure out what to happen, what, what to do next, Brian. That's and then right. we, we, then, a- we then transition to the cozy corner motel and the big reveal of this issue, Chris, you finally learn the name of the hotel's proprietor. He is Mr. Mr. Carr, too, is not only that old uh, Irish woman outside Dublin, but of Mr. Roper from the classic Three's Company, who, <laughs> who, uh, who did not want jack to live with two women until he thought jack was gay that's right so and even though Richard rory does wrong here even <laughs> though rory has helped mr carver board up the window that got smashed last issue uh as rory leaves for his midnight shift at the radio station mr carver tells sybil he's a real oddball that one a walking mess of trouble and immorality <laughs> <laughs> I want you to put that on your business card. A walking mess of trouble and morality. <laughs> and as Sybil leaves the hotel, she sees Brian Lazarus stumbling across the parking lot on the verge of collapse. Uh, and we find out that the, the, the man thing has followed him here, sort of safeguarded him here to civilization. And, 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 and I guess we could cut to the chase and say that in Sybil Mills, uh, Brian Lazarus has found the uh, the person he's been looking for, someone who will listen to his song cry and his hurt without asking him for anything. Um, they talk about music and he talks about how music was his life. But one day, <laughs> one day he came home from work, put rubber soul on the stereo, rubber soul for you youngsters is one of the Beatles' most famous albums. One of their um, best albums. Uh, and he says, I put it on, and it just sounded like noise to me. Ugly, ugly, ugly noise. That's when I knew I was dying. Because not loving music then, is like 
death. We then get the, and I, I, I chuckled at this. If JF Gonzalez was alive, he would have chuckled at this because he did many years as a, a, a writer of ad copy. Uh, you know, we get the frustrated novelist who's, who's angry that other writers make fortunes telling lies by writing ad copy. <laughs> <laughs> well, in comparison to what most writers make, ad copywriters do make a fortune. <laughs> That's right. Um, so we get into that, and and he shares uh, his song cry. He hands over the, the written pages to uh, Sybil, and then we the and 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 I'm I wish that Steve Gerber were still with us, and if Steve Gerber were still walking the earth, I probably wouldn't say this. But then we get the utter nonsense that is the song cry of the living dead man in prose text on the page of this issue. And and from my perspective, Brian, the less said about this, the better. <laughs> yeah, I love the thing. And and I don't know if Gerber originated this, but it's it's something that he does occasionally, and that is, you know, the the text with format. Uh, I think the best example of this is giant size man thing number four, which we'll get to in a few weeks. Um, I love it when he does that, but yeah, the, 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 what Brian Lazarus has written here is absolute gibberish. Okay. (laughs) This guy isn't getting published. Right. Exactly. (laughs) It reminded me of something Nicholas Piccioni might've written. (laughs) Um, but you know, Sybil sees something in it. Uh, she says, there's such terrible pain in these words. (laughs) Uh, and and there is there is uh, you know yeah um so Sybil and and Lazarus you know they grow close he bursts into tears um he's happy that somebody finally understands him uh you know the man thing uh goes wandering back off into the swamp well and, because uh, now he feels sort of that relief inside he's no longer exactly. drawn to Brian Lazarus's emotional state and so he starts wandering away, excuse me, until all of a sudden he fear, fear, feels, I can't even speak today, a fresh influx of horror and pain and fear because the bill collectors have returned, Brian. That's right. Not just the bill collectors. Now we, we get the living embodiment of, of the bill collectors, but also a monster car and <laughs> an evil clock and an evil washing machine. <laughs> And it's a piece of paper that says lies, 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 lies on it. Yeah, it's a great double splash page. And for those of you who typewriter. Yeah, for those of you who listen on YouTube, I'm going to throw this up uh, on on the YouTube edition of Defenders Dial. It's a page here. Uh, But, you know, long story short, uh, they manifest inside the hotel room. And for the second time in two issues, the man thing bursts back in the hotel. Yeah. Yeah. So the man thing goes in, he breaks it up, he throws the manifestations around. Uh, he's going after Brian to stop the 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 flow of these emotions. And Sybil jumps in his way and, and he casts her aside very roughly. So she's injured. Um, and Brian can't believe that she stepped in like this. Now, we should tell you Sybil is fine. Right. But Brian says, nobody ever cared enough to think of sparing me pain that way. And his revelation that there's somebody who cared enough about his pain to suffer their own pain somehow cures him of this affliction that has been haunting him. The manifestations all uh, sort of vanish into nothing uh, and it leaves them. uh, It leaves them together, Brian and Sybil. She, he says, you did that just to show me uh, that you feel, you care that I'm not dead, basically. And she says, no, I did it because I'm sure you'd have done the same for me. You're that kind of person. And he says, I am? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, these are not, you know, uh, you know, I didn't, it's not that I didn't enjoy reading them. I did. But they're, they're certainly far from the best work we've seen in the series. 
Um, they do, however, Brian, pave the way for, and I haven't read these issues, but all I want to say is that the next two issues that we're going to cover, issues 13 and 14 of the Man-Thing, do involve a flying pirate ship and its crew. Uh, so um, we have that to look forward to. That's right. And they will become uh, one of the Man-Thing's uh, major villains in the Man-Thing's weird rogues gallery. Uh, so it'll be very cool to revisit that. I, I loved them as a kid. Uh, looking forward to rereading those issues. And speaking of looking forward to reading things, folks, I uh, I have read Red Hands by my co-host Christopher Golden. Um, it's frigging amazing, and it's timely. Uh, <laughs> if you want a novel about 2020, <laughs> I'm curious. You you obviously started writing this before the pandemic. I finished it before the pandemic. Yeah. So you know, what's what's interesting to me though, Brian, is not that like. So it isn't a pandemic. It is a, a contagion, but it isn't a right. pandemic in the book. It is basically that one person can can cause people to sicken and die almost immediately by touching them. Um, but it is about contagion and disease. But more importantly, the thing that the, that resonates with me the longer that that COVID goes on, and I think about red hands, the thing that resonates with me the most is the fact that the central concept is if you are afflicted with this you can't touch anybody for fear that you might kill them so you right. need to isolate yourself from the rest of the world right and um and, and that is the thing that really kind of you know uh the more i think about it the more that's the central conceit of the of the book right and yeah. um anyway so uh you yeah, know i had no idea obviously well, it's a great book. I haven't finished it yet. I'm about halfway through, uh, but it's fantastic. And folks, yeah, I, I, I recommend it highly. Go to Amazon.com, Red Hands by Christopher Golden. You know what? While you're there, make it a twofer. Purchase Red Hands and get uh, one of the many books by our engineer, Matt Wilson, who does this show every week. Um, and there, that's your second. Christmas shopping done. I second that. Exactly. <laughs> All right, Chris, send us home. You know what, Brian? I say Excelsior True Believers in episode Excelsior 120 indeed. of Defenders Dialogue. That's right. And good night to uh, Hank Wagner and, and our other 14 <laughs> listeners. <laughs> oh, man. All right. We'll see you next week, folks. Defenders Dialogue. You can listen to this episode and all previous episodes for free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play Music, and wherever else podcasts are available. Defenders Dialogue is written and produced by Brian Keene and Christopher Golden. Our theme music is by Xander Harris. Our engineer is Matt Wildeson. Check out his books on Amazon.com. 